Hi, welcome to KubeCon Cloud NativeCon North America 2020 virtual. My name is Dave Cremens. I'm a cloud server architect uh, working in the network platform group in Intel. And today I'm going to talk about how we can enhance the Kubernetes networking model with SmartNix. So for today's agenda, um, I'm going to talk about the edge, um, bare metal deployments or bare metal as a deployment target for the edge uh, and Kubernetes. Then we'll cover um, Kubernetes networking model, um, the, the simple requirements inherent in, the, in Kubernetes itself uh, from a networking perspective and some of the trends that we've seen over the last number of years, uh, especially as, as new industries on board to the Kubernetes platform. Uh, we'll then discuss uh, SmartNix and the types of categorizations we can apply to SmartNix. And then disaggregation, which I think is a, a key aspect of, of how we can enhance the Kubernetes networking model and maybe some more um, discussions around offload techniques. So I, I wanna start by, by discussing the edge um, just, just for a moment. So the, the depiction here, um, you know, I, we keep hearing things around what, what actually is the edge and the edge is simply geographic distribution. Computing done at or near the source of data. So as you can see here, we have different aspects of the edge. We have the on-premise edge, we have the access edge, uh, we have near edge, we have far edge, you know, and it's all in terms of, you know, the point of presence. Where exactly does it lie from a geographic perspective? You know, and what kind of computing can we do um, at that location? Um, so, we also tend to look at, you know, edge computing and, and there's close tie-ins and alignment with the, the 5G world. So like the move to 5G is driving changes to edge computing and it is driving adoption of 5G solutions. These 5G solutions come with the promise of lower latency, higher capacity and increased bandwidth. And when we start looking at the type of deployment models available from an edge perspective, we see things like, you know, public models, we see private on-prem type models, and then we see a hybrid, uh, which is kind of like a combination uh, of all of them. And there are four main markets that are targeting edge computing today. And, and they are the IoT market, enterprise, telco, and cloud. So, why would we look at a, a bare metal deployment for, for the edge? So like we have numerous legacy applications that still require to run on, on virtualized platforms. Um, you know, so they, they, there are um, inherently from that per perspective, there are numerous deployment models for the edge. We've bare metal, we've virtualized, we've para-virtualized, et cetera. But edge deployments will need small footprints. Um, and even as we, we see the likes of, you know, the cloud capabilities and processing moving towards the edge, we see things like the telco industry adopting cloud native patterns and applying it to the edge, that the footprint becomes uh, very critical. Um, in the previous slide, we showed um, a depiction of the geographic distribution of, of um, edge deployments, which essentially means that, you know, we, we need to be very aware of, of our, our surrounding environment for when um, an edge deployment um, is, is, is modeled there. You know, so like we, we don't have the space of a modern data center. Uh, we have little tolerance for extra server capacity, like for instance, uh, virtualization. So we need to try and avoid that tax if, if possible. And um, the lead time for new hardware at, at, at an edge location is very slow. So we, we need to ensure that we, we prime our deployment um, uh, correctly so we get it right the first time. And I think bare metal is, is ideal for the likes of network functions uh, that, that really require that deterministic and predictable performance. You know, and why, why is that? Well, why is bare metal a good choice for, for, network, for network functions as we transition from the, the, the VNF world to the CNF world, or we move, you know, legacy VNFs and orchestrate them in, um, in something like Kubernetes? Well, we have full access to the hardware, which, which is fantastic. Um, by, by virtue of the fact that we have full access, we automatically have a reduction in the amount of resources that we need. So we, we, we look at this scale up model where we can scale up the, the capabilities of our, our bare metal platform versus a scale out model. 
Um, and, and I think this aligns nicely with the, with the smaller footprint. So we, we scale up as opposed to out. We also have options to leverage accelerators like FPGAs or QAT or GPUs uh, for more types of uh, performance gains and for more acceleration options. And with, with bare metal, I, I'm a firm believer that we were capable of generating higher throughput, lower latency and superior performance. And this pretty much aligns with the 5G promise and even the edge deployment requirements themselves. But another key aspect to why bare metal is um, very um, applicable to the edge is it's it's more aligned with uh, dynamic aspects. You know, we, we don't have, you know, taxes like the virtualization aspect. We don't have, you know, static configurations that need to be in place um, when it comes to the bare metal. We, we can um, provision our, our system, configure our, our host options, have our, our OS running, and then we have a number of runtimes in place then that provide abstractions around the, the governing software that's going to run on that particular platform. And these components can be swapped easily. Uh, and, and this facilitates you know, infrastructural changes with little side effects to applications. So I do believe that uh, the edge is... Um, the edge is, uh, is pr or bare metal, sorry, is prime for, for edge deployments. So my key takeaway is that the, the bare metal edge is better designed to address the needs of telco and can deliver on the speed and performance required by 5G solutions today and in the future. So we have edge, we have bare metal. So how does Kubernetes fit into the picture here? Let's maybe examine some, some trends out there today. So forecasters are predicting huge increases in edge computing. Uh, and this essentially is down to the fact that there are a uh, sheer quantity of edge instances compared to centralized cloud servers. And these edge workloads will continue to rise. They'll grow more complex and they'll become more demanding. So when this, when, when we get into this uh, particular um, arena, you know, infrastructure and platform resources need careful management. You know, so we need to be mindful of, of you know, how we manage these aspects to ensure that we can meet the requirements of, of edge workloads. And Kubernetes is going to play a very critical role in this particular space because inherent to Kubernetes is the ability to abstract the infrastructural capabilities while still providing a robust and scalable platform. Like this essentially is, is perfect for the likes of the edge because Kubernetes doesn't really know or care about whether it's going to target, you know, a cloud deployment or an on-prem deployment or an edge deployment, you know, it, it's 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 one of its key strengths is the abstraction around the infrastructural aspects, you know. So so with this in place, um, how do we how do we ensure that we can leverage the edge platform to to do um, what it, what it's meant to do essentially? You know, or in terms of how do we get the best out of, a, of an edge deployment? So what we need to do is we, we need to start thinking differently. You know, we need to be aware of the boundaries and separate out the concerns. And to achieve that, we can look at things like, you know, disaggregation distribution. We need to look at how we, we manage our, our resources on our platforms so that we get the, the best out of our platform. And we need to ensure that we have instrumentation built in from the ground up so that we do have observability capabilities in place that allow us to collect, process, learn, and even optimize. So Kubernetes is, is, is going to be um, a, big, a big player in the, in the edge arena. And, and one area uh, in particular that I would like to focus on from an edge perspective is the, the Kubernetes networking model. Um, so the, the networking model today in Kubernetes has some simpler requirements. All pods and nodes can communicate with all pods without NAT, and the IP that a pod sees itself as is the same IP that others see it as. You know, so the, the, this is very primitive to, to, to Kubernetes networking, but that hasn't stopped advanced networking models uh, with complex properties being deployed in Kubernetes all the time. And, and what do I mean by complex properties? Uh, I mean things like you know tunnels and overlays, you know. Uh, advanced sidecar meshes with, or sorry, with uh, advanced service meshes with um, sidecar deployments, um, IPsec and zero trust. Um, and we have data plane technologies then from the the, the low latency, high performance uh, domain. So things like uh, DPDK and, and SRIV, et cetera. And, and then 
pertinent to uh, telco then are, are multiple network interfaces required on, on a pod. And, and remember that Kubernetes only supports a single interface from a control plane perspective. And, and any other interfaces um, available via the pod are, are not visible to the Kubernetes control plane. You know, so my point here is that Kubernetes networking has advanced as, as the years have rolled on um, and as new, um, let's say, workload types have onboarded to the Kubernetes platform. You know, so like these type of properties require platform resources to deliver on their respective claims. So let's take an, um, an example of um, Oven for Kubernetes. So if we see here, uh, what's the, the, the idea here is that um, I want to try and highlight that there, there are complexities involved in uh, provisioning a Kubernetes network um, to ensure that we have connectivity, that we can uh, traffic can be um, directed uh, to egress, or we can accept traffic on ingress and things like that. We have you know network policies in place, so and we 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 have a whole plethora of of operations and behavior that are defined from a networking perspective. You know, so like even in here, just to provision a simple pod with Oven um, and to ensure that we have the, the right integration with uh, OVS, uh, we have three streams of work. We've got the, the Kubernetes pod creation flow, which is essentially um, the one to four, or at least the, the, the Roman numeral version. Uh, we have the, the network settings generation flow, and then we have the network settings application flow. So like a, a lot, and you will see that there, there are a number of different contenders um, in the networking space for Kubernetes. You know, we, we've got other SDN controllers that, you know, will have um, equally as complex properties and configurations that need, they, they need to deploy and manage. And, and you know, they, they, these are, are absolutely critical for different types of applications to function correctly. You know, so Kubernetes is not all that prescriptive in terms of what it mandates from a networking perspective, but we still need the extra complexity and characteristics of the STN controllers that are applied today to ensure that we can meet the demands of the workloads that are now running on Kubernetes. And, and the, the, another key point here is that change is, is inevitable. Networking architectures are continuing to evolve and when they evolve, they become even more complex. This is already happening. Um, and it's the edge will be targeted with these type of um, complex uh, networking deployments. You know, we've got things like network observability. We've got things like um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. We've got service assurance in terms of the, the whole closed loop model. You know, and, and these, these kind of constructs require extra processing. That they'll, they'll need um, uh, much more time on, on, on the CPU and access to memory. And there'll be a lot more going over to buses uh, um, as uh, compared to the likes of, you know, very simple networking requirements. So we need to be careful um, when, when this happens because the networking models are evolving. The, the computations are also getting bigger. But we, what we see here is that we see um, an, an explosion in, in bandwidth capabilities. We see, you know, an increase in the, um, the amount of traffic that needs to be processed. And this is kind of disproportionate to the, the amount of resources available on our platform. You know, so while the, the pipeline gets bigger, while our fabrics increase, our bandwidth increases, uh, the amount of traffic increases, our, our platforms are, are kind of struggling now to keep up to ensure that we can still provide that deterministic performance and uh, abide by the, the SLAs that have been agreed to. You know, so why would we utilize our platform resources for let's what we'll call infrastructural boilerplate if we don't have to? So we do have options in terms of disaggregation where we can leverage the likes of hardware offloads. And, and, and this, I think, is something that the Kubernetes networking model can, can easily benefit from. So from a networking perspective, you know, we have uh, smart NICs are being discussed um, and they're, they're being targeted to things like the, the edge, they're being targeted to things like the cloud, they're being targeted for things like um, let's say on-prem and hybrid models. And really, what do we actually mean by, by a smart NIC? You know, and, and how does a smart NIC afford us the opportunities to accelerate um, 
the the networking aspects, or, or even not just the networking aspects, but multiple aspects of the the entire workflow. So you know, if you look for a definition of smart NIC, you know, it's hard to to settle on any one particular definition. So I, I I've put in um, a number of definitions that you you should you will probably come across uh, if you start researching the likes of what smart NICs are. I've come across things like network attached acceleration platforms a new processing environment, um, a target for a network pipeline, a programmable data plane, a location to run infrastructure management components. Let's move some of the control plane aspects to, to a smart NIC. And uh, another uh, categorization, or not categorization, but let's say another um, type of, of uh, target for the smart NIC then is uh, a guarantee for the network integrity. So move the, the root of trust directly to smart NIC hardware. So let's let's provision our networking model, let's provision um, you know our, all of our policies and enforce them at the smart NIC layer and free up our, our platforms for, for processing. So we take the, the the trust and the security model and we move it down the layer into the actual smart NICs. So this allows you know cloud admins, assist admins to, to program the, the networking model so that tenants can can operate uh, without uh, breaching uh, security boundaries. But also when we look at smart NICs, you know, we see um, uh, different variations in terms of the categorization of smart NICs. We see system on chips and then we see discrete versions. Um, you know, so like this particular diagram here is the what we're trying to say really is the degree of smartness may vary, right? So we need to look at things like configurability. We need to look at, you know, offload capabilities. We need to look at flexibility and efficiency also. And flexibility and efficiency, um, you need a delicate balance be between both of them. Both are required. So if we look at like the system on chip model, uh, we have like the likes of maybe programmable cores if we're using a, an ASIC. Uh, we've got, you know, FPGA system on chip, which allows us to do configurable logic. Um, if we move across and we look at look some of the discrete models, we have ASICs that are more uh, limited in terms of their flexibility. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to change them. Uh, and then we have, you know, combinations like ASIC and FPGA, uh, which provides um, the, the efficiency and the configurability or flexibility uh, required. And then we maybe have like um, a full-blown FPGA. But, you know, to, to do this, like both of these are required, you know, in terms of flexibility and efficiency. Um, so, and with this, we can look at things like, you know, performance, uh, security, and, and, uh, and offloads. And these are the type of things that, you know, we can move to a smart NIC uh, to, uh, to allow Kubernetes to target what it needs to target in terms of ensuring that workloads are running and in their pods or in their containers, in their pods, on their platforms. And this type of, you know, um, employment of, of smart NICs really is conforming to what we call like a hybrid computing model, where we have uh, cores available on our platform with, uh, you know, memory and storage. And we also have um, cores and um, accelerators um, via the, the smart NICs. And these are like, you know, domain specific architectures. And the domain in, in our case for this particular talk is, is around the, the, the networking processing um, capabilities required for, you know, especially the telco domains. So smart NICs are um, essentially, the, for, for to, to keep it abstract for this particular talk, let's, I'm, I'm going to, um, let's say, define smart NICs as um, a platform that has uh, processing capabilities and offload, offload acceleration capabilities also. So we spoke about um, the, the boundaries, you know, in terms of what our platforms at the edge should do. And, you know, we spoke about how we could uh, provide some disaggregation at the edge. So, the, the, you know, the edge, you know, based on the, the first uh, diagram in the, in the first slide, it doesn't have an abundance of resources. It's not like a, a data center. Right, as we said, it doesn't. It's, it's constrained, um, and but but that doesn't stop us wanting to bin pack as much workload as possible at the edge, you know. So to, to deliver on what edge computing claims to be able to deliver, 
You know, so we want to provide predictable models for deterministic performance. But how, you know, how are we going to achieve this? How do we disaggregate concerns from our main platforms and move it towards, um, or let's say, sorry, alleviate the pressure on the platforms and move it elsewhere? Well, we want to leverage a sidecar platform, but apply that to the infrastructure. As was done for, let's say, the, the layer four to layer seven type applications with the service mesh architecture by deploying, you know, side cards that, you know, take care of the data plane within the pods. We also want to leverage the same concept and apply it to the infrastructure. If we do that, what does that yield for us? It means that network flows can be programmed and offloaded. So we have things like OVS traffic control. We have RT flow for things like DBDK. We can offload these directly onto our, let's say our smart link in this case. Traffic can be forwarded between the, the physical functions and the virtual functions without going through software. So we, we, we have acceleration almost immediately. Um, so we have no software in play. It's purely a, a, a hardware concern. We have inline processing that can stay in the NIC and then Lucasi can directly transmit to the target. So no data movement back or forth uh, within the, with, with the host. So we've eliminated that and we've created that boundary that, that I've been uh, speaking about. So it's still in the NIC. So our platform and our utilization of our cores is very, very low with this type of offload or this type of capability. We can also look at programming our security policies and having them managed by the smart NIC. So we can have our access control lists managed there. We can have our network policies managed there. We can do EPPF offloads. So we can do filtering, load balancing, monitoring, etc. All of the, the, the things that come with the, the EBP, EBPF um, work or at least EBPF technology. And we can also then leverage the smart NIC to uh, deploy observability pipelines. So observability by today's standards is, is very important. Uh, we want to ensure that we, so we're, we're already in what I would call a reactive model where we have um, the, the, the standard process of where we collect the information, uh, we generate some insights, and then we try and leverage that. You know, So it could be the case that we, we, um, we detect that a particular network slice in, in a 5G scenario um, isn't, or it's going to run into trouble uh, in terms of delivering on its its um, its SLA. So we can use observability pipelines to ensure that we, you know, start to provision out uh, a new slice, or that we increase the the capabilities or bandwidth available in that particular aspect. But that's that's reactive, you know. So we're still we collect information and then we make a decision or we make an action based on what we've collected. But what happens when we want to start moving towards um, proactive models where we have um, smart intelligent systems deployed sitting on our smart NICs that are able to over provision as needed or we can um, uh, move pods between different locations so all, all of this again is something that you know I, I believe uh, would be come to the forefront once we, we have fully embraced um, you know edge computing and, and the the 5G solutions that will accompany that. But the very important point here in terms of disaggregating concerns and processes from the edge perspective is that uh, this shift is not new, right? We want to facilitate advancements in networking, in Kubernetes networking, but without the cost of the extra CPU cycles. This is a perfect fit for, for edge scenarios. It follows the exact same patterns that have been applied across data centers and clouds for the last number of years. So smart NICs provide programmable solutions. We can enhance our overall networking model while Kubernetes continues to orchestrate business value. And that's the key message here that is very applicable for, for edge computing. So now that we you know, have um, opportunities to enhance the networking model via um, a smart NIC offload, uh, and with smart NIC deployments for numerous targets like the, the edge, the far edge, um, the cloud, enterprise, etc. What other offloads can we leverage? How, how can we also disaggregate um, other aspects, maybe even of the control plane? We can t use things like, you know, um, dedicated FPGA devices, uh, quick assist technology for things like encryption and compression, and GPU for, for more offloads um, for, for graphical, for um, intense processing um, with, with graphics or, 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 or even more mathematical computations. 
like for instance uh, machine learning and things like that so my point here is that data planes can be offloaded but so too can control plane concerns like encryption and compression in the case of a qat device which can offload uh, that and save more cycles so this um embracing of acceleration i think is is um of acceleration and potential offloads is is paramount for um the for edge computing to succeed and kubernetes is um, um, very equipped to handle these type of scenarios. Um, it just what, what we need to bring to the table is uh, these particular offload capabilities and ensure that we have successful um, orchestration in place, which I think is is very very possible. As smart nakes are already are, are already deployed today, there have been numerous talks over the last number of KubeCons around um, uh, smart nakes and offloading things like OVS and uh, the cache path and so on like that. But this this talk really is about enhancing Kubernetes as as it's going to be deployed at the edge and how smart nakes can can provide new opportunities for us as can um, other offload technologies and other off hardware offloads. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you.